Hi, my name is Diego Rojas Perilla. And I'm Zoe Buck Bracey. We are part of a team called Open Syed that provides freely available high quality science instructional materials. We recently sat down with Juan Pablo Carvalho, an electricity systems researcher from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. Juan Pablo is originally from Chile, and he has been studying and working in the U.S. for about 10 years. Juan Pablo's work primarily focuses on long-term planning for a more reliable and sustainable electric grid. His group studied the crisis in Texas, and in our conversation, he provided insight into the disparities in who lost power that February and the need for rethinking our systems to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. We're transitioning into a future with higher renewable energy penetration, lots of wind, lots of solar, transitioning away from polluting fossil fuel resources. And in doing that, we're facing several challenges. One of those challenges is how to keep the lights on. How, as we transition from this old system that was easy to operate in many ways and more predictable, but very polluting, to a system that is less predictable and harder to operate, but much cleaner, is challenging what we call the reliability of our power system. We have been increasingly realizing that climate change is inducing a number of much larger and frequent extreme weather events that are causing this blackouts or interruptions to be more widespread. Historically, there have been many inequalities in the side effects of power systems. We're interested in understanding how some of the bad things about the power system, in this case, the unreliability of the system, may affect some population segments more than others. And we took the case of the big Texas winter storm from February 2021 to try to understand how were the interruptions caused by this extreme weather event distributed across the population in Texas. We wanted to know what Juan Pablo thought was the primary cause for the blackouts in Texas. He pointed to a combination of problems with energy supply and a spike in demand as people turn on their heaters. Due to the very low temperatures and the lack of what's called weatherization of many of the generation units in Texas, several different types of technologies stop operating. At the same time, these very unusual winter storm that brought very low temperatures caused people to use more power. They have to keep the balance of supply and demand exactly matched at every single second. And for these, they have several look ahead periods. They usually have a day ahead and an hour ahead, and then even a five minute ahead. And they started realizing that their forecasts for the demand side were also pretty off. That created a further mismatch between the supply that's already curtailed and demand that's not even at a regular level, it was much higher. And because of diversion of resources towards heating, these two started creating a problem in which there was not enough supply at a given point in time. And the operator in Texas started realizing that they did not have enough resources to meet demand. Juan Pablo explained that if the energy going into the grid was spread too thin in an attempt to meet demand, there would not be sufficient energy in the system to keep electrons in the wires moving fast enough. This could cause the whole grid to shut down, causing weeks and weeks of widespread outages. They start doing uh, rotating outages and removing demand from the system, try to bring it down to the supply. This was largely localized to approximately 4 million customers out of the 12 million customers that exist in Texas. We wanted to know what decisions the Texas power companies had to make when deciding who had power and who did not. Juan Pablo explained how electric systems are set up to help us understand some of their decision making. The electric system is set up when you're looking from the larger transmission system, big plants or solar farms or wind farms that are scattered around. And they all connect into what we call the transmission system. Big lines that you can see sometimes with these big metal towers and, and thick wires that, that seem to go you know, miles and miles and miles. So once you hit an area closer to a population area, you step down the voltage. So you bring down this transmission line's voltage to a lower level for safety, and you start distributing into the cities with what we call the distribution system. So a feeder is this poles that you see in the streets. And those are the ones that ultimately get the power into the city. There are switches that these operators can, utilities can operate. And those switches allow them to remove power from an entire feeder. 
And in doing that, you know, leaving, unfortunately, thousands of people without power. But it allows them to quickly bring down demand to help demand meet supply. So they know if this particular feeder is supplying a hospital, a, a jail, a police station, or a water treatment plant. And they try not to cut those essential services. And so in general, if you are less lucky in some ways and you're not living close to any of these facilities, you're more likely that in a decision like this, your power will be cut down. We asked Juan Pablo to tell us about his group's initial hypothesis. We were exploring minority groups and low-income groups, trying to understand whether higher or lower income people had been affected in a different way. And we were also analyzing whether areas that have high presence of minority populations, people of color, were more affected than areas that have lower amount of minority population. Juan Pablo shared the story of how he found the data that would allow his group to answer their questions and explain why county-level data doesn't provide enough resolution to draw conclusions. For any research, we need data. Ideally, data that is publicly accessible, because if it's publicly accessible, that data becomes transparent, becomes a type of data that anyone can analyze and draw their own conclusions. And it turns out that there's very little public level data on, on reliability. The best available data set that we found was from a firm called poweroutages.us that collects the outage data that utilities put up in their web pages. The problem is that this data was clustered, was aggregated at the county level. And there are many counties in Texas that are really big. And the variety of population within the county is very vast. And so we couldn't really draw any useful conclusions at that level. I remember reading about what was happening in Texas in in mid-February. And I reached out to my friend Jay, who is a professor at UMass in Amherst. And I knew that Jay and his group had been spearheading very interesting satellite-based analysis for assessing electricity access and access to other types of infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa. They were realizing that if they used satellite data, they could learn a fair amount about what's going on on the ground without having to deploy very expensive surveys or other types of data gathering processes. So that's why we decided that if we were able to use our satellite data, we were able to bring the focus on a much, much higher resolution. We decided based on the demographic data that we had available, that was available at a division that's called the Census Block Group. So Census Block Groups is one of the many divisions of the U.S. Census. It groups populations in the order of 500 to 2,000 people, sometimes even 4,000 people. The satellite data allows us to look at pixels, little squares of light that are about something like half a mile on each side. We had millions of those. There are many technical reasons why we operating at that small level wasn't really useful. So we decided let's cluster our pixels at the census block group. And we ended up going from 250 counties to over 15,000 block groups each one of which was much more homogeneous, much more similar, and each block group could be identified much better as an entity that had a certain level of minority population and a certain level of income that was much more likely to be similar across all people living in that place. The scale at which you can gather your data, the resolution that you have for your data, does indeed enable different types of answers and enables you to make different types of decisions. So when you look at this same analysis at the county level, you do recognize that there were some counties more affected than others, but you can't really tell what's going on in each one of these counties that makes them less or more favored. And so in this particular case, that's why we looked at a much more granular resolution for our data. We asked Juan Pablo what his group found. He showed us some of the data representations emerging from their work and explained to us what they meant. This chart here is showing three levels of income, the poorest, the medium income, and the wealthiest. And then down here from least, medium, and high minority, it shows the average percent of the population that was in outage. And we do find that people that live in high minority areas had about three times more likelihood to suffer from an interruption compared to least minority areas. The one thing that you can notice here is that if you pick one of the minority levels, and you look across the three income levels, they seem more or less stable. And what we actually found is that the income levels do not really matter as much. If anything, it looks like if you have lower income, 
you are more likely to, to not have suffered interruptions. So the higher the income, the more likely you were to suffer an interruption. And that's a counterintuitive result. Most people would have hypothesized that the you know people that are disenfranchised and vulnerable that are low income would have been more affected and our results are pointing in the other direction. And that was a little bit surprising. Based on Juan Pablo's work, we wanted to know more about potential design solutions that could prevent crises like this in the future. One potentially novel way of thinking about it is, is that in general, we think about, okay, what fail is the system. Is this a system that takes power from point A all the way down to point B? And so let's make that system stronger. The truth is that now we have new technologies that can be deployed at point B. We have solar panels that you can put in homes. We have storage batteries, big batteries that you can put in some homes. And although some of these are not affordable for many people, and some of these require very specific infrastructure needs, so people that live in multifamily homes and big buildings, it's harder for them to have some of these things. Those devices can indeed provide power when the main grid is out. And so this also points out at this how we can start thinking about these new ways of ensuring that people have power, even if the main way of re receiving power through the system is not working. Texas is quite unique in that it's isolated. Most of the other states are grouped together in big, big interconnections that share power. And so whenever one side suffers a problem, the other's components can go help. Texas is unique in that they had made a decision to not have those interconnections, or at least not have them built high enough. Finally, we wanted to know if Juan Pablo had any ideas about what could have caused the disparities his group identified. He told us that what his group had identified was a correlation, but that this did not necessarily give us any insight into what causes these patterns. We don't really know what caused the disparities. Whether there was some intentional, malevolous idea to keep certain types of populations without power, we don't think that that was the case. It's not in the interest of the operator to be looking for those criteria. It will be extremely hard to make a decision, a conscious decision to affect certain populations more than others. This is the point where distinguishing correlation and causation is important. So what this analysis is saying is that there is a high correlation between the presence of minority population and the share of interruptions that those populations suffered in this particular event. The cause and whether the fact that these populations are a minority is indeed what causes these differences is much harder to prove. A high majority of the larger blackouts were located in the southern portion of Texas. The reasons for that tend to be much more related to the way that the system is built and the way, in general, the fact that the northern Texas are much better prepared for lower temperatures than the southern of Texas. It so happens that in the south of Texas, there is a higher concentration of people of color living. It's, it's a correlation. We were thinking, is there an historical bias in the infrastructure investments? such that over time there has been an underinvestment in certain areas where people that are poorer or a high minority live. And so those areas break down more easily. And there is some evidence from other surveys that were conducted after this big event in Texas that that could be the case. And then probably another one is to understand whether this hypothesis that the load forecast error that may have created a larger gap of supply and demand in certain parts of Texas was also potentially one of the causes. What were those forecasts? How, how historically accurate they have been? And what was the potential influence in those forecasts in making some of these decisions? There's not an immediate cause in terms of those folks living there and someone wanting to give them you know, a harder time. It happens that they may have been just located in the wrong place at the wrong time. Is this an excuse for these results? Probably not. Probably means that we have to do better in reinforcing the system and also really in understanding that these kinds of events that are types of events that happened one in a lifetime in the past are going to become more prevalent and more frequent. We better start identifying mechanisms and technologies and processes that we can use to protect these populations, no matter who they are, just because they are now living in areas that in the past had not suffered these kinds of events, and now they will.